We are here with uh, Eugene Kunin, uh, senior biologist at the National Center for Bio Biotechnology Information. And he is in Padua in the physics department, the LEAF lab, to, uh, to give some lecture about uh, evolution. Uh, good morning, Professor. Thank you for being with us. Buongiorno, grazie. You gave some lecture here in Padova about uh, uh, evolution. Do you think that uh, the Darwinian theory of evolution is still current? Uh, should be revised at the, in the light, uh, on the light of the recent uh, discoveries? Thank you for the question. Uh, before answering it on substance, I really want to thank uh, uh, Professor Sandra Zeile and Professor Amos Maritan of the uh, physics department for inviting me to give these lectures uh, and to talk to theoretical physicists, which is always uh, a privilege and a great pleasure and uh, very helpful for evolutionary biologists. Now to your question and to Darwin. To begin with, uh, we must greatly appreciate what Darwin has done. Uh, he um, really, in the absence of in our today's understanding, in the absence of serious data, uh, was able to understand uh, the key driving forces of the um, evolutionary processes. Um, uh, in the most general sense, his vision remains central to our today's understanding of evolution. But of course, uh, this, uh, he, he worked um, nearly 200 years ago um, in a completely different scientific landscapes and not so much revisions, uh, but um, uh, development of uh, more inclusive, more complete and satisfactory theories necessary and to a large extent has happened in different uh, stages. I would um, primarily note that um, Darwin's vision uh, for, um, for all his genius uh, um, uh, was purely qualitative. Uh, um, he um, did not and could not uh, um, formulate a mathematical theory of evolution um, um, for a variety of reasons, because, uh, because he was not a mathematician at all, that's one thing. The other is that the um, nature of heredity was unclear to him, um, um, and without that, um, further um, development um, was uh, simply uh, um, uh, impossible. So today's evolutionary biology is, of course, a quantitative science. Um, um, and the beginning of that uh, um, transformation of evolutionary biology into a quantitative science, um, in many respects similar to physics, uh, um, uh, was in the work of Ronald Fisher and other founding fathers of population genetics in the 1930s, uh, late 1920s and 1930s. Uh, um, but the process um, uh, continues to this day and into the future of uh, um, turning, uh, of transforming uh, evolutionary biology into uh, um, uh, true uh, theoretical quantitative science. Being somewhat more specific, uh, 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 the quantity, these quantitative approaches uh, allowed us to understand much better uh, the crucial and, in a sense, creative role of chance, of randomness, um, in the uh, process of evolution. Uh, according to Darwin, and that was a great insight at his time, um, randomness played out only at the level of changes themselves, the um, um, what we now call mutations. But um, the uh, um, subsequent um, acceptance or rejection of, um, of these uh, um, uh, changes by uh, evolving organisms, in Darwin's vision, was completely deterministic, was uh, defined uh, fully uh, um, uh, by um, uh, selection. Um, the, Population genetic theory that is still de mm, develops and is being refined um, defines the conditions under which selection can be efficient as opposed to those conditions where evolution is driven by what is called genetic drift. And that is simply fixation uh, of, the, uh, of 
random mutations for purely stochastic reasons, or, or speaking, or um, using, or paraphrasing Darwin's, Darwin's metaphor or, um, of uh, survival, uh, survival of the luckiest rather than survival of the fittest. This is one key um, notion. Another key notion um, has to do with what is known as gradualism. Charles Darwin, again, for all his genius, was a man of Victorian times uh, and um, uh, really wanted to think of um, accumulation of small and slow change, uh, uh, which at some point leads to greater change. But to him, uh, the uh, evolution was completely essentially gradual uh, process. We now understand, I think, and this is relatively recent, this is not entirely fixed even in the minds of evolutionary biology, but I think indisputable that gradualism is false. And the um, principal changes uh, um, in, um, uh, in evolution, the origin of true novelty, such as, for instance, multicellular organisms, just from, unis uh, from ancient unicellular ancestors, occur as, um, in a process that is deeply similar to phase transitions as physicists study them. Um, and, and that is crucial, and now uh, um, uh, we move forward to what we are doing today. Uh, um, that is uh, um, trying to uh, um, develop um, a true physical theory of the evolutionary process in which um, uh, borrowing, borrowing the um, um, concepts from phenomenological and statistical thermodynamics, um, equilibrium and non-equilibrium, where uh, the concept of phase transition resulting in increasing complexity is central. I think I tried to answer your question as best, as best I could uh, in general terms and in the short allotted time. In a study published this year, uh, you and your colleagues uh, wrote about uh, the uh, evolution as a multi-level learning. What did you mean exactly with this expression, multi-level learning? Mm, uh, thank you for this question. Uh, I think this is indeed uh, more or less the forefront of our understanding of um, evolution, as it seems to me. Uh, Multi-level learning means that in the modern um, um, neural network um, systems, um, um, deep learning, um, um, there are um, multiple levels of what is called trainable variables. Uh, that is, um, the system um, um, has multiple layers which learn and change at their own pace. Um, in a sense, um, for a learning system to be efficient, um, it needs um, a long-term memory that changes slowly, as well as a more, react as more reactive components uh, that um, um, learn quickly uh, based on changes on the signals that the system receives, on changes on, um, in the environment. In this very oversimplified description, I think you nevertheless can already see um, analogies with the um, uh, evolutionary process. The long-term memory is, is embodied in the highly conserved uh, part of, of, uh, of the organism's um, genome, uh, and the more reactive components uh, um, uh, correspond uh, to uh, faster changing groups of genes, as well as the direct um, um, phenotypic um, reaction of uh, organisms. The astonishing realization uh, of the last few years is that there is um, a very detailed and um, naturally definable correspondence uh, between three areas of um, our understanding of the world that uh, superficially seem to be quite independent. 
namely thermodynamics, first, um, learning processes, um, second, and biological evolution, third. Um, to put it uh, in, 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 in a nutshell, in the simplest terms, all these processes are unified by the uh, um, uh, existence of uh, um, um, an optimization function. Um, um, there is some quantity in each, each of these spheres uh, um, which is minimized or maximized in the course of evolution. That may be simply free energy uh, in thermodynamics or what is called the loss function. The degree of knowledge, let us say, about the, um, the environment um, uh, in, in learning uh, and fitness uh, in evolutionary process. There is deep and it's a natural uh, correspondence uh, between uh, um, uh, the, um, all these processes where optimization uh, um, uh, takes uh, place. Uh, um, so, in, in, the, in necessarily oversimplified in two general terms, uh, um, uh, this is uh, what we mean, and um, I think this presents just the beginning of um, some new level of understanding of evolutionary processes, um, um, both in uh, um, life, in living systems, and in the um, universe in, in general. Um, and if we want to understand the origin of life, and we surely do, uh, um, uh, some unity uh, in, in our um, theoretical um, representation of uh, um, biological and um, processes and those in inanimate matter is essential. In your work, uh, you also focused on viruses. Uh, what uh, role do the viruses uh, play in the evolution uh, um, in, in the comprehension we can have, we can get of evolution? Yes, uh, uh, thank you very much um, uh, for uh, this question, uh, uh, which is, I suppose, particularly uh, pertinent as we are still dealing with the consequences of the not quite ended pandemic. Um, uh, the thing about viruses is uh, uh, that we must, must, we must appreciate how pervasive, uh, how ubiquitous uh, viruses are in our biosphere. Um, uh, viruses are the dominant entities in the biosphere. Um, um, we, we, uh, we, the public, uh, um, uh, usually think of viruses as agents of diseases, but the thing is uh, that there are multiple viruses that infect every life form that exists on Earth, uh, from the simplest bacteria to uh, um, uh, mammals and plants. It is, in a sense, a law of, in biology, uh, uh, that uh, um, every organism is infected by uh, um, multiple viruses. And then, um, moreover, viruses change very fast because they evolve uh, um, through what is called the arms race uh, with their hosts. In the hosts, only some parts that deal with defense against viruses change very fast. Viruses as such, uh, evolve very fast, and um, being uh, abundant and ubiquitous, uh, they um, um, uh, comprise uh, most of the genetic diversity that exists on Earth. Uh, therefore, um, it's completely hopeless to try and understand evolution of life uh, uh, without uh, including uh, evolution of viruses and the co-evolution of viruses uh, with uh, um, uh, the hosts. Well, um, to be just slightly more specific, I will add um, that um, um, virus infection and the necessity to um, um, uh, resist it in large part drive the evolution of complexity of life on Earth. The last question is about uh, the um, role of science and of scientists in the society. 
in this February, you signed uh, an open letter against uh, the uh, invasion uh, of uh, Ukraine, and you also renounced uh, to the membership of the uh, Russian Academic, uh, Academy of Sciences. Is there uh, something that uh, scientists and uh, academic and scientific community can really do uh, to stop the war and to sensibilize the, the popular opinion? Of course, scientists can do um, uh, very little uh, directly. But as you already pointed out, it is important, uh, nevertheless, to be clear about our views of this situation, to display unity of scientists across the borders, um, to um, understand uh, um, uh, that Many, many Russian scientists, and especially the best ones, actually, um, have nothing to do with the um, aggressive uh, politics of, of uh, their government. They're, they're essentially held hostage. Of course, there are different voices, and their um, uh, voice, uh, unfortunately, uh, um, voices of uh, support for the criminal war uh, um, uh, from um, um, some individuals uh, in charge of scientific institutions uh, in Russia. I think we, as scientists, who have the privilege to, 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 to live in the world that still, in the part of the world that still remains free and democratic, um, uh, we must um, very uh, clearly define our positions of condemnation of all these voices that, um, that support the aggression, but of support of those um, um, uh, of um, uh, our, uh, our colleagues who do not, and, and most especially those who try to resist. At the same time, I should say, we also have to understand that the situation in, in Russia itself is extremely difficult. And uh, um, if, if some of our colleagues remain silent, that is unfortunately quite understandable. I was, I was speaking for now about Russian scientists, but of course much more, the um, same and much more uh, goes for Ukrainian scientists, much more, um, uh, because um, um, there everything, including scientific institutions, is, be, is, um, is being destroyed directly, and we, again, must voice our support as well as practical help, and uh, provide as much practical help um, uh, as we um, uh, as we can, and we are trying uh, to do this. Um, again, um, we can do um, very little directly to defeat the aggressor, um, uh, but still I think our position is not without importance. Thank you, Professor Eugene Kuhn, for answering our question, and thank you to the physics uh, department at the University of Padova, LIFLAB.